we're going to open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Um, we have begun this study. It's, it's pretty simple as you walk through. You're going to get through chapter 5. We're all going to be rolling along and and uh, 6 isn't too bad and then it progressively gets a little harder to understand. Um, I've always said this in the book of Revelation. You just got to be careful. I did. Dogma is it you just minds change through the book of Revelation. There's a lot of different ways to view this. And uh, so I just keep an open mind and my mind's changed multiple times through the book of Revelation. I was very much uh, raised a premillennialist with that view, uh, very much uh, probably the way of the majority maybe of people see it. I, kinda, I don't really take that stance maybe now as much, but I'm definitely open to, to interpretation there. Um, we are going through into thyword.org if you want to kind of follow along to, to some of my teaching through this. You'll see that there uh, in Revelation. Worthy is the Lamb, Ray Summers is a good book. Um, also, and I've got some of these, uh, and this is the outline we'll share. Mostly it is Revelation uh, done by Richard Rogers. Very, very, don't always agree with Richard, but I, I think he does a, a really good job of, of keeping uh, Revelation in its place. Uh, once again, doesn't matter which view you take, whether you uh, take a view that it's happened or going to happen or happened and happening or whatever. It, it talks about something that I think we all got to hold on to is we, we serve a victorious Savior that reigns in a kingdom that will be victorious. And whether, however you view the end of Revelation, it shows that those that are on the land side, the king side, are the ones that are victorious. Doesn't matter how you interpret. Doesn't matter if you think he's going to come set a kingdom here on earth or if he's already done it. Really doesn't matter, okay? It just shows it. I think those are the things we stay with. Those are the things that we'll, we'll remind ourselves of. Doesn't really matter, uh, you know, where we sat. So we're going to pick up through with the churches. We closed out. Uh, and once again, when you're reading Revelation, a lot of times just let Revelation tell you what it means. A lot of times it will. You don't have to jump to conclusion. Um, there at the very end, he was talking about um, of chapter one, you know, that, that he holds the keys to death. And uh, he says, right, therefore, what you have seen, this is right at the end of one, what is now and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. And he explains that. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Okay? And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so now we're going to dive into those. We're going to talk about those churches. We are going to break them up, Don. We'll cover them over the next several weeks because it's too much to try to get all of those seven churches done. Um, I'm not sure, as, as you look at these seven churches, if they necessarily uh, were an individual church or if it represented uh, more than that. Um, I kind of lean towards these are individual churches, okay? Uh, I think we can read about Ephesus, can't we? And we'll talk about that. I really believe these were individual churches. But what we want to do and what we want to glean from it is we want to be able to read about that church, the good things they did and the things they didn't do, and learn from that in our body of Christ today, right? And that what, that's what the Bible's for. We, we read it and we learn. We say, okay, that didn't work or that did work or God wants us to do this. And he definitely doesn't want us to do that. It's really interesting, these churches. John is very blunt. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to continue to do. And here's what you need to abstain from. Uh, today, in a, in a world where I think the, the bodies of Christ want to be more accepting, there is an accepting practices that the church needs to take. You know, I think sometimes churches got so judgmental. But then there's also stands we take, right? You can't let everything in. You can't let everything run the body of Christ. And I think that's what we're going to see as we walk through these churches. Churches that become complacent. Churches that, that, that are saying, oh, it's okay. Come on in. Even though we don't agree with that practice, we're going to let it happen. That wasn't the thing we should do. And so we'll see that as we walk through these churches. Let's begin there with 
with chapter 2, and I need a reader there for verses 1 through 7, and that's the first church we'll talk about is the church in Ephesus. So somebody want to grab that and read that? To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lamps, stands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have per perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, you remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. <clears throat> Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Ephesus. We're going to go back and as we see the Apostle Paul preach and this church, uh, we see its birth, okay? Uh, John is, is, is talking, you know, 30 plus, maybe 40 years later after the birth of this church, okay? So Ephesus had been running a while. This church had been going. Um, it's the greatest harbor in, in all of Asia at this time. Three great political distinctions. It was a free city. It was a miniature Rome, okay? It was a judicial city, and it was a fun city. You'd think of, of Ephesus. It, there was games going on in Ephesus. It was, it was like a mini Rome, you know? So a lot of things happening in this great Ephesus. And I want to just go back to Acts chapter 19 and 20. And let's read that because here we see the birth of this church, okay, in Ephesus. And let's get an idea of what was going on there. And I think it's interesting. A lot of good things said about Ephesus. A lot of good things said about this church. And there's a few things that, that they need to get cleaned up. So let's go ahead and go back to Acts chapter 19. Don Coot, you got that for us? What verse? Just start reading there at, at chapter 19. Let's just walk through 19. Look at this real quick. While uh, Paulus was at Corinth, Paul took the road to the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No. We have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people uh, to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, into the name of Lord Jesus, when Paul placed his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate, and they refused to believe and, uh, and publicly blind the way. So Paul left them and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Arrhenius. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, 
a Jewish chief priest for doing this. One one day the evil spirit answered him, Jesus I know and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped over him and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held high in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they when they calculated the value of the scroll, the total came out to fifty thousand drachmas. drachmas. And this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Acacia. And after I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. Keep going, yeah. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen and related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus. And in practicality, in, in, in practicality, uh, the whole province of Asia, he said, says, that men make gods or no gods at all. There is a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also the temple of the great god Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they had heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized uh, Gaius and Arist Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companion from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in a, was in confusion. Some were shot in one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet. And do not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the court are the courts are open, and there are co-counsels. They can press charges if there is anything further you will bring up. It must be settled in the legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. I wanted to, to you to read that because you know this is this is where we really find a little bit about Ephesus. What's going on? So, get, what about that sin? Is it an easy city to go in and, and, and preach the gospel in? No. Probably not. Okay, probably not. But the gospel took off there, and the church grew. And do you remember the Ephesian elders there in, in Acts uh, chapter 20, 
were very much a, a part of Paul's ministry, okay? And so the Ephesian church just kept growing, growing, grabbing strength. Today, you know, here, here's, here's a place over in Turkey ceases to be. The church is, is gone, okay? But let's go back into Revelation chapter 2, and let's take a few things, what was going on in that church. Remember, this would have been... 40 years later, maybe, close to from that event back with the Apostle Paul. And he says that, uh, I know your deeds, verse 2, and your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. Now, remember the Apostle Paul in, in, in Corinthians talks about the super apostles, remember? As if these people went around acting like apostles, but they weren't, okay? And he says, you've tested them. He says, and have found them false. What would have been the test? How would you test an apostle if it was true or false? How would you test, How would you test an apostle? Well, What's that? Have yeah, have you seen the risen Lord? I mean, that was an apostle. That was and, and so the, these were these were denying Paul's claim, and yet these apostles were were in it for their own good, and and so you had to be careful. Uh, the name of Christ can be preached, and it's a wonderful thing. But like anything, there'll be different churches rise up with the name, but have a different purpose. Our purpose isn't to make money. Our purpose. Is it for just our own good? But it's for the good of all. And the church needs to see a resurrected Savior. And I think today it could be the end thing to be going to a church. But is your church coming together and are you spreading the right news? And I think as we walk through this, we got to see this all the way through, especially in this church in Ephesus. And it says, you know what? You, you guys are doing good. He, he kind of goes down the list. He says, you guys are active. You're, 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 uh, you're, you're hard work. They're, you are persistent. Uh, he even goes, you're intolerant of wicked men. Uh, you, you're looking at that. You're a consistent church. He break, breaks everything down. But then he says this. He says, you know, hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Now, what do you think he meant by that? You have forsaken your first love. Anybody with anything else other than that? Forsaking your first love, Jesus. Now, there would be some different, you can get into different commentaries on that. I, I think that's right. I mean, I think that's where the text would, would take you. The first love was Christ. Being a Christian, to be a Christian, we fall in love with Jesus and we become his disciple. But we follow him. That's the whole idea. The idea is we become a servant of his. There's a covenant reached, okay? There's a marriage in a sense. That's that's when when we come to Jesus, we are we 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 marry him in the idea of we he, we're now in a covenant relationship with Christ. He's above all, okay? And so what this church did, there it, it probably started to become rule fall, okay? Now, we got to be careful with that. Even in all marriages today, just compare it to your marriage. I mean, this is the way it could become. You're, you're in a marriage, and it, it, love may be drifting off, and you're just kind of going through the actions. we got to be careful that as we live out our Christianity, it's not just about the actions, okay? That's what that happened to this church. I think it became the actions. Oh, they did these things well. Oh, you're doing this 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 well. Oh, doing this well. But... There's something that Christ had against them. It was that they fell out of love with the one they needed to be in love with. Their first love. And that was Christ. And he says this. He says, remember the height from which you have fallen. Go back to the very beginning of your relationship. When you were when you were totally in love. Now, I wanted to read Acts chapter 19. Think of what they would have come out of. Think about what, what you would have come out of to become a believer of Jesus Christ. What do you think he came out of? Some of the greatest idolatry anywhere, right? 
Yeah, Artemis. I mean, here they left this goddess Artemis. They would have left the way that they were brought up, and they would have said, you know what? Yes to the one true God. And they began, they began this relationship with him, and they began to follow him. And all of a sudden, all the works that they were producing were based on the fact that they just loved Jesus. Why do you do that? Because I love Jesus. All of a sudden it became, why do I do that? Why am I a good person? There's a lot of teaching out there to be a good person. I think it's important. But being a good person because we love Jesus is what it's about. You understand that? You can do all the good deeds in the world. It won't save you. You understand that? That's sometimes hard to understand. When you interfere with business, yeah. it's like you're me for this <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, well, wait a second. Yeah. This is our business. And they left that. They left that, that goddess culture. And they moved into to Christianity. And they, they fell in love with Jesus. And all of a sudden... Their works were begin, were produced because they loved Jesus. And then somewhere in that relationship, things changed. And they produced, they obviously produced, didn't they? Doesn't it show that they were producing? You may look at that person and go, boy, there's a person that is man, it's all about good works. He's well, they were peaceful. following the doctrine, remember the baptism, mm -hmm. didn't know, you know, in prayer, well, they, Let's get it right. They did that just right. But oh. Now, when you start interfering with business, well, <laughs> I know your deeds. They're good. I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. I know there's there's wicked people out there. You call them out for what they are. You 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 can't take that. And you're just consistent. You persevere and you endure uh, hardship for my name and you're not growing weary. Those are all great things. In fact, we may walk away and go, they got her all together at that church. But he says, this is something that is very serious. Why are you doing it? Why are you doing those good works? Now, this is a question we have to ask ourselves. Why do we do good works? Because we're God's creation. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared us in advance to do so. You know, and so we are doing it because of our love. And I, you know, you 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 compare that into your marriage, into your covenant relationship with your spouse. You you begin to do things for the other. Just you love them and you do that. And I think that we gotta remember that in our relationship. Why do you do the things you do? Well, it needs to be about Jesus. It needs to be about that relationship that we have with our first love. He says, so here's what's happened. Remember the height from which you fall. So what? how do you fall in love again with the one that you fell in love with and became a disciple? How do you do that all over? But, you repeat, but there's, there's a word there. What does it say? It says, repent. I think there's got to be a time where we realize that we've done this. Okay? This is, there is a separation. It's, it says that first thing we got to do is realize what's happened here. This is, I think it's very important as Christians that we always drive a stake. That we always ask ourselves, why am I doing that? Am I doing that to look good? Am I doing that just for the good deed that I'm doing? Or am I doing that because I'm in love with Jesus? And you can, we get a lot of answers here. Well, yes. If we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we do good things for not the right reasons. Okay? And this maybe is what's happened to this body of Christ in Ephesus. This, this church is, is, is doing good things. On the outside, it looks really good. But he says, you've, you've forsaken your first love, he says. Remember, so the first thing I want you to do is remember the height from which you've fallen. Remember where you used to be. Go back to, to you know, sometimes when you get into a marriage and, and the marriage is on the rocks and, and you'll go visit a counselor. They'll say, and, and this is very common. Go out and date again. Start it all over. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to get you to remember what it was at the very beginning. When you were 
in love, when everything was great, when you overlooked all the other one's faults, okay? Didn't even know they had it, right? You know, and, and, and you were so attracted to them that you just looked right by that. Here's what John's saying. Remember that time. Remember when you, when you came into the relationship with Jesus Christ. I can only think of these guys. Remember when th th that huge weight of their sins was lifted off of them. And they just kept that covenant relationship with Jesus. Everything they did was because they loved Jesus. Okay? The second, first thing he said is remember. second thing he says is repent. When we violate God's law, it requires our repentance. Okay? That's, that's, repentance is a very important thing. Why do you think repentance is so important? What is repent? First of all, what is repent? Well, if I told somebody, repent, what would that mean? Confess your sins? Kind of. They're, they're, that's part of it, but what, what is repent? Change. There's a change, which <laughs> confession is going to be tied right with that. But it's going to be a change. It's going to be a complete turnaround. I was walking in this direction, okay? And when I'm asked to repent, I'm changing directions. I'm going to go the other way. So here's a group that I believe became probably very legalistic, meaning this. They were going to do good works. It was a good thing. I want to do this. I want to make sure to tell the evil people out there, I don't like it, but I don't approve of what they're doing. But the love of Jesus wasn't there anymore. That first love. He said, remember, repent. And he says this third thing. Three R's. Remember, repent, and let's look there. He says, do the things which you did at first. Date all over again. Okay? Go back into that relationship. Whatever it takes to get that fire burning again. Get that fire burning again. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand for, from its place. Okay? So, Remember, repent, and then do the things which you did at first. That means return. Just remember those three things. Remember, repent, return. Okay, those three things, very important. If you are struggling, what, how, what do we take this? And once again, not just as a church, just as an individual. How am I serving Jesus right now? How is that relationship? Are the things that I'm doing because I love him above everything else? And it says... Uh, there's an importance here. If you don't get it done, what takes place? We remove your lampstand. The lampstand. Well, I don't debate on that. What is that? I, you know. Uh, what's that? Didn't you say the lampstand? Oh, yeah, it was the church in Ephesus. He's saying, hey, church, I'm going to remove your lampstand. What does that mean? You cease to be the church. That's what I think it means. I really believe that. I think when when you don't do things for others, you cease to be the church. You may have the name. You may have a name out there, but but are you truly following those practices? And so I think it's very important as you look through that that lampstand being removed. I believe is you, that's not the body of Christ. It's very important. Any questions with that? Any other ideas with that lampstand, the removal of the lampstand? We have a different view there. Well, I thought it was pretty good. Well, Sunday you mentioned the fact that, you know, if you are drifting from Jesus, get in there and get really <laughs> You should never be uh, far from the gospel when mm -hmm. you're reading and you're studying, you know, knowing who the Lord is. Absence does not make the heart grow fonder. I'm just going to tell you that right now. It does not. You stay away from the word, it doesn't work that way. It stays, it, it's kind of like the fire, you know, the, the coal that is removed from the blaze and set over here, what happens to that coal? It dies out, and that's just the way it is. And that's, that's our relationship with Jesus. You can't, you can't get enough of his word. You can't read enough. You get, it's just part of it. And what it will do is, as the more we get involved in it, the more it becomes a part of our life, the more we want it. It just works that way. That's that's the way the Word of God works. It just seems like once you're engaged, I, I, this isn't something Genesis or Revelation. I find it very hard just to, to read in a couple days Genesis or Revelation. Anybody else? 
do you guys, how do you guys roll through that? Do you guys, every couple days, read all the way through? <coughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it just doesn't work that way. The Word of God is something that we, we set and we study for years. If, if, if we're having a hard time with this whole being in love with Jesus, then we've got to get back to the Gospels, okay? You've got to start saying, okay, what did he do for you? You've got to start thinking about that. And so there, you just need to change some metal uh, pictures there about what's going on with your relationship with Jesus. He says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Christianity, a lot of times, is for the overcomer. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not something that one of the worst things we could go teach, I really believe, is the idea that one day you just profess Jesus as your Lord and then you stop. You will never see that in Scripture. Never. You hear that teaching that. Oh, just get, you know, get right with Jesus. Then it doesn't really matter what you do beyond that. Just, I, I just have never found that in Scripture. Um, I've looked for it. Um, I just don't see it. But overcoming, I've seen, practicing Christianity, always buffeting your body, looking where you're at. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Philippians says, work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. You know, because we know who God is, we know we know who we are, and so Christianity's a work. It's it's now it's not a work to be saved. Don't misunderstand what I just said there. Salvation's a gift of God. You're not going to earn that. But but understand that every day we are working on our walk. You know, very much like a marriage. Just try to do that in a marriage. Say, I love you once and never say it again. How would your spouse react to that? Well, I told you back when. Our battles, I said, I love you. I'll need to say it again, do I? How would that go? Anybody? Well for you? <laughs> Probably not. Okay. Same thing with our relationship with Christ. I mean, you know, what? we just don't dive into a relationship and say, okay, God, I love you with all my heart, with everything I got, and then I'm done. No, this is, a, this is about overcoming. This is about totally in love with Christ, trying to fit our life because of what he's done for us. Us, okay. Now, let's go on to the next church. Uh, it's interesting. At, at the end there, he says, you'll have the right to eat from the tree of life. I do find that in the paradise of God. Do you remember the garden? Remember the garden of Eden? They ate from the tree of life and lived. They were driven out of the garden. They were driven away from the what? The tree of life in paradise, in Eden. This is the book of Revelation. It tells us God is going to bring Eden back to us. And then we will be able, that's going to be the end. We'll be able to be a part of the tree of life again. And we will have life because of that. So we'll get to that later uh, in that uh, last chapter. Very good. So the angel, the church, and Smyrna write. Now, we're going to leave Ephesus and we're going to move to Smyrna. And it says, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say you are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison and test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay? So, whole different city. Here's a city that is uh, the center of emperor worship. Okay? The center of of Jewish people. Uh, remember the name Polycarp? Remember that? One of those church fathers born in roughly 70 AD. 
69, died in roughly 150. He, he died the martyr's death, okay? Uh, he was one of John's disciples, all right? So he, if he was born in roughly 69, that would have put him where in 95? You know, he'd have been a young guy, you know? And, and so he's hearing what John has to say. And what John is saying is, there is going to be a persecution that comes to your church, okay? Here's what's going to happen. And he breaks it down. And, and so if, if you're getting this from Smyrna, and the first of all, I want to say, anything bad happened in Smyrna? In this church? Okay, not, not one, he never said one bad thing. He just said this, and I think it's very interesting. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. Okay, so this was a church. If you could only imagine, have you ever been to a super poor church? I mean, like, you went in there and you went, wow, that's a poor church. There's one in Mexico, right? Right outside of Toluca, Mexico. Uh, Mexico City up in the mountains is Toluca, this little church that uh, they, they, there was a church going there and it was actually in a home. Looked very much like a lot of these churches in the, in the New Testament were in homes. And uh, this church had a dirt floor and, and you know, it would just, it didn't have air conditioning like this building, you know, there was, there, there was no money in this church. You know, and everybody was there, and they didn't have any money. But they were there for one thing. You know what that thing was? <laughs> to worship Jesus. That's why they were there. Okay? Not at all. They couldn't help anybody at all. Somebody would have come in and said, you know, can you help me out? They, they definitely wouldn't have went to that church and asked for a handout. Because it wasn't going to happen. Very much Smyrna. Now, I think it's interesting what, what uh, John says to Smyrna, though. He goes... He says, uh, I know your poverty, yet you are rich. Now, if you get into the Greek and look at that word, that is filthy rich. Not just rich. You ever known somebody filthy rich? <laughs> Not just rich. Boy, that person is wealthy. But then you get to that, that person is filthy wealthy. Well, you know what filthy wealthy means? They, if they want it, they're going to be able to obtain it. Period. That's what John says that church was on. Because you guys are filthy rich. It's your poor. How does that figure out? How does that figure out? Because they had the right kind of relationship. Our relationship with Christ makes us filthy rich. And not rich in the ways of the world. It's a different kind of rich. Okay. So he's talking to this church in Smyrna. So he goes into this church that is, I mean, they're just, they're broke. They have nothing. They're, they're, they're dirt floors, you know, no way seem like we have today. There's just nothing there. And so he's going to give them some good news, okay? Here's his good news. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Okay? Do not be afraid of them. You know, first of all, we're barely getting by. And now John says, don't be afraid of them. Do you know what the word suffer means? Anybody want to try that word suffer? What does that word suffer mean? If I say you're going to suffer, what does that mean? Well, it's a physical thing. When we're going to suffer, it means we're going to probably lose something. And I can only imagine this church going, what else do we got to lose? Your life. That's what you got to lose. You don't have anything left. You are, you are the true Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That word patokos. You don't have one single thing to your name. That's Smyrna. And then he goes, you're about ready to suffer. What else can they take from me? Your life. Your children. Your grandchildren. They're going to come in. They're going to take it. And they're going to kill them right in front of you. And that's what takes place. That's what takes place. In our, when you go back tonight, right, that's what Domitian did. And he continued to do it. That's what happened to Polycarp. Later, they, they burned Polycarp at the stake, and he wasn't burning very good, so they slammed him with a sword. Remind you of anybody? That's our Jesus. He prepared us for that way. And that's what was happening here. Now, you can say, oh, that'll never happen. Well, you know what? In the last year, I don't know that I'll ever say that again. You see what I'm saying? We never know how this world can change and how we can go from a very free country and have a lot of freedom to
to not being free anymore. Do you understand that? It's very important. I appreciate what we have. And every day that I see the things maybe that we don't have now, I'm thinking, well, we, we have a lot. And so he goes, he said, you're about to suffer. I tell you, he says, I tell you the devil. Now he's just going to break it down for him. I'm put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, remember these words, 10 days, sevens and tens and stuff. They don't necessarily always represent 10 like we think. That's a complete number. You're going to be for a season even. Okay. You're going to be for a season in prison. He says, uh, be faithful. And then he says this, even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. Now, you want to know why he said even to the point of death? That's what they're going to suffer. They were going to go to the point of death. Are you going to be able to do it? Are you going to be able to handle it? I could, I could do it myself. I, I really, that's not the issue. The issue is those families, they tried to break them, okay? They tried to, they tried to get you to go ahead and worship their gods. They wouldn't, if, they don't, if I just kill you, it's all, what if I took your grandkid? What if I took your children? See, that's what they did. They were total scumbags. That's how they were, that's how they reacted. And if you look at history, you'll see that. And if you go, Josephus writes about that. And you'll see a lot of that taking place. You'll even read that in, 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 in the Hebrew writer talks about it, okay, of the different things that took place. And this wasn't the first time in history. Uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes that, that uh, uh, was part of that uh, Grecian Empire uh, in 161 BC did those kind of things. I mean, they, they just did horrific, horrific. You, you've ever read the, the Maccabees, the revolt? That was what was going on. Judas, you can go into that Judas Maccabees. It was ugly stuff were happening to Christians, okay? Ugly stuff were happening to God-fearing people. And this is what they were doing. Any questions with that? Even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. What is that crown? That, that word crown, Stephanos, a victor's crown. A symbol of triumphant. Okay, so here's what John is saying. If you will do this, I will give you this. What are they going to give you? What are they going to give you? That's what I've always said. As a Christian, what is the world offering you that's better than what God is offering us? One of the reasons I'm a Christian. I think all of us sat here as Christians because of our hope. You know what that hope rests in? Jesus. That Jesus, that heaven reward that we're going to have. It's called the crown of life. We, we, Paul said, I go ahead and prepare and I run the race as to win the prize, he says. Remember that in Corinthians? Paul said, I run the race as to win the prize. He's, he's, he's in it for the crown. That's because it's an eternal crown. There's no crown greater. There's no, there's no trophy greater. We, we work hard for this Sometimes you know, these Olympics and all these different people that, that work hard and they, they win this crown and then it tarnishes. And then it, uh, what's O.J. Simpson's Heisman Trophy worth today? You know, where is it even at? It's pretty impressive maybe back when he won it. But what's it worth today? What's your crown? What's the most important thing to you? You see what I'm saying? That crown will never tarnish. You can win a lot of crowns here. You can do a lot of work. It takes a lot of discipline to win different awards and rewards. But let me tell you what. Compared to that eternal crown, you can't compare. Okay. The crown of life. The reward. The, the prize. Okay. He who has an ear letting here. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. There's going to be a second death. That's not always the greatest thing to preach. And a lot of churches maybe have eliminated that from preaching, which is a fact. God's going to come back and he's going to judge. There's going to be a second death. Okay. And by staying faithful, it keeps us from that. Okay. It keeps us from that. And so you will be judged. They'll, they'll, that day's coming. And that, that's part of it. It'll keep you from the second death. Okay. We've all died once, spiritually. We live in Christ. We don't want to go back through that. Okay. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. 
Okay, now this sword that Christ has here isn't the sword of the gospel. It isn't the Ephesians sword that we read. This is a judgment. Okay, Christ is coming in judgment. Now I want you to stop right there with that idea. I want you to uh, turn over. Let's look at that because Revelation is going to deal with that a little bit here. Um, let's see. I thought I hit it down here. One, somebody turn to 116, chapter 1, verse 16. And then somebody go over to chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. So let's go first with Revelation 1, verse 16. Somebody have that? There's the double-edged sword. This is a sword of judgment, okay? In his right hand he held seven stars. <clears throat> and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. Okay, there's Christ. He's, he's not bringing the gospel. The gospel's already been preached. When, when, that, when that one comes, it's now shut off. Okay? There's, it's, it's, it's not like, here he comes. Oh, now I'm going to get right with Jesus. It doesn't work that way, okay? Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. So he's going to come in judgment, okay? The double-edged sword. Somebody has that in 19. That's that's a good one in 19, 11 through 16. You're going to see how we'll talk about that later. But go ahead. 19, 11 through 16. I saw him that standing over the there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him. That no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine raiment, white and clean. Out of the mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings, Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, I want you to get this picture in your mind because this isn't this isn't the preaching of the gospel now. I mean, here's the church. Okay. What he's saying is, here comes the right. Okay, here comes a rider on the white horse. Here comes the one called Faithful and True. Here's the victorious one. Who is that? There's no question in their mind who that is. Who is that? Uh, Jesus. That's the one they serve. And he's going to come, and he's going to come with that double-edged sword. This is not the sword of the gospel. This is judgment. 19 tells you that. that there's fear. Now, if you're a believer of that day, that, that's a good feeling. You can do anything you want to me, but you'll never change the eternal outcome. You may change the temporal outcome. I may have a big day planned tomorrow, okay? And if you come in and kill me, I'm not going to get to the temporal day that I had planned tomorrow. But you can't change the eternal. This is very important to a church that is under persecution. This is the book of Revelation. These are churches that are going to go through unbelievable persecution. Okay? Unbelievable persecution at the hand of Domitian. And they're going to have to know, and they're going to have to have that feel-good thing. Listen, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth serving the one that we serve because we're going to go through this. Okay? Any questions with that? I think it's very important as we look at the book of Revelation. Is to understand this is a church that's being persecuted, and you know what? It's worth it. The eternal reward is the reward is worth it. Okay. Okay. The double-edged sword says, verse thirteen says, "I know you live where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas." It says, by faithful witness who is put to death in your city where Satan lives. So they've been through a little bit of this. Is, this didn't just happen in the, the reign of Domitian. This has already happened. 
Nero and on. I mean, these guys were, were remember the Jews? They used what army to kill Jesus? They used what nation? Rome, right? Okay, to kill Jesus. And so uh, Rome had, had an ugly black eye, okay? Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold the teachings of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. In other words, you haven't totally left your old life. This is very important as Christians. I'm not going to say everybody sitting here is living perfectly because we know better than that, don't we? Okay. Doesn't happen. We, we try the best we can, but sometimes, you know what? We, we're sinners. We sin and fall short. But what he's saying here is, when we come to Christ, we are going to make every effort to lead that life of sin. Don't bring it with you. That's what he's saying. There has to be a change. That's the repentance. That's a, there's got to be change. David was a great guy, okay? Wonderful guy. When he committed the sin of, of adultery and the sin of murder, was he chastised? What was he told to do? Pretty much repent, wasn't he? Did he? Absolutely. Did God forgive him? Absolutely. There's a great example. And But David was not okay in that sin that was happening. That's why Nathan the prophet was sent to David. David wasn't getting it right, okay? He had finally hit the point where he's going, well... I guess I'm just going to do this and keep moving along. I'm, I'm the king. But God could see it. And God knew it was not right. And therefore God went ahead and brought Nathan into his life. I think you and I have got a word for that. I think you and I can say, are there any sins that, that we've not left behind? I think the call is, as a church, look at that. We can't go ahead and say, oh, it's great. Here we've got, we've got this person who's not left his life, life of sin, but yet is here and we're so happy just to have them. We don't really care if they ever leave that line of sin. Why are we coming to church? Listen, we're not coming here because we're perfect people. We're coming here to be made perfect. And we're coming here trying to leave that life behind us. Okay? Very important, I think. Didn't leave, didn't leave that life of sin. It says, like, likewise, you also have those who hold to the teach, teaching of the Nicolaitans. It says, repent, therefore, ask him again, just exactly like Ephesus. He says, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some hidden manna. I, I think that's kind of interesting. Man. You know, what do you think of when you think of manna? So it's yeah, but, uh, you know, you think of God feeding the Israelites. I always think of that. And then I always think of John when, when Jesus is pretty much the man. Who do we feed on today? We feed on, we feed on Christ. Uh, somebody turn over there to, I think I've got it down here, is John 3, I believe. John 6, verse 3. Somebody turn over to John 6, verse 3. Same writer here, by the way. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. And then, okay, go ahead. Is that right? Yeah, keep reading there. Okay. Um, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Yeah. Therefore Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This that, that's not the scripture I wanted. That's, okay. that's a fine scripture. Okay. It is in... Okay, let me read, read, okay, 35, read 635. Start there with verse 35, John 635. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All the thought that the Father gives me still will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven and do not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For 
for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Perfect. What would Jesus call himself? I mean, he is what? The bread of life. He is the hidden man. And those that feed on Christ will be what? Raised up the last day. Okay. We've run out of time. I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. But uh, any questions at all? Last minute or so. This is the easy part. <laughs> We can, we, this, we can just follow right along and it's all, hey, Revelation's not real hard yet. But it's a lot of stuff I think we, we need to clean as a, as a church. I mean, we really do. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we are so thankful for this day. We're thankful for your teaching. Always a, a joy to go into your word and just, just discuss it, look at it, talk about it. God, we want to be more like Jesus every day. And God, help us to do that. This is your son's name.